E-cigarettes may soon be banned from public spaces, and bikers make sure they are not left behind this session. Details in Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The Senate State and Local Government Committee took up a bill that would regulate the sale and use of electronic cigarettes, also known as e-cigarettes. Senator Kathy Sharon carries the legislation that would ban the use of e-cigarettes in public spaces. Proponents say the vapors could be harmful and the public should not have to face the effects of secondhand vapors. Opponents say there's no conclusive evidence that the vapors are harmful and this bill goes too far. If someone's smoking a tobacco cigarette versus an e-cigarette, is it just as bad or is it a better product? There is certainly a wealth of data that we still need to gather on these products. Um, I think from a tobacco prevention, my background in tobacco prevention, um, we've set a clear standard for clean indoor air in our community, and that standard is not uh, set at uh, secondhand tobacco smoke, it's set at clean indoor air. And these products may fall somewhere in between there, but they certainly uh, have an impact on the clean indoor air of the standard that we've set for the past seven years in our state. This is blind regulation. There is no scientific basis for this, for this interaction. And anybody who values sort of any basic common notion of freedom really should reject this bill. I do know that there are those that, uh, as been stated, uh, would let anybody do whatever they wanted to do until we were absolutely certain that what was happening was harmful. The government has. At the end, the public does have an interest in being protected no from the, the harm and to not ask the public to take a risk on a product that has in it a substance that is toxic and in, in a product that has a capsule in it that can contain a variety of substances, none of which we know whether or not it's being vaped into the general public air or not and that the failure for us to have assurances, because we don't, we don't have the regulation, we don't know what's in there, to ask the general public to take a risk on that, I think would be the irresponsible action. If, if there's no basis, no scientific basis, no basis whatsoever for acting in this case, then there really is an unlimited ability for us to regulate anything with preemption. The burden is always on government to prove harm or risk of harm before acting, or at least it should be. I think if the, there isn't, then there's no limitation. No, I think Ma the burden is on the industry to prove there's no harm before we legalize it. We, we respectfully disagree, Madam Chair. Senator Kathy Sharon's bill that would limit the use of e-cigarettes, banning them in indoor spaces, is moving through the legislature. She's here to talk more about what her bill would do. Thank you for joining us, Senator. I'm happy to be here, especially to talk about this subject. Yeah, let's begin with exactly what would your bill do concerning minors and then also the indoor space component? Uh, those are the two major sections of the bill. Uh, the component related to minors is that it uh, be illegal to sell uh, e-cigarettes or any of their associated products to minors, those under the age of 18, and that the product be protected by being behind the counter. And let's talk about the indoor space component because that obviously is the more controversial part of the amendments that are taken up. Yes, the other discussed. part of the bill mm -hmm. is to allow the smoking of e-cigarettes in the same way that we allow tobacco products to be smoked but restricted uh, in public places. So it would follow the same law as relates to the use of, of tobacco. And that seems to be where the, the controversy stems, is treating this the same as a cigarette. So what's your reaction when, when they are bringing up the fact that it's not necessarily tobacco, although there is some nicotine found in these vapors? Uh, yes, nobody's saying that it is tobacco. Uh, we're talking about a product that has a vapor that someone exhales. You're inhaling and exhaling a product into the space that we all share. And what this legislation does is indicate that the public does not want to take the risk that the smoker of the product does uh, when uh, exposing themselves to e-cigarettes. The research is inconclusive as to whether it's safe. It's inconclusive as to whether or not it actually does help people quit smoking, although there's anecdotal stories indicating that some people have experienced that. 
So we want to support those who want to take their own risks with e-cigarettes, an unregulated product, a product that we're not completely certain from one form of the uh, inhalant to another that it's the same or what is actually in it. Uh, we, we aren't interfering with an adult's decision to make that choice in their own lives. But the bill does say we don't want to expose children to it, either by selling it to it or by making it uh, visible for people to observe or inhale in public places. Senator, you were talking a little bit about the inconclusiveness of these studies. So how important is it to you to move forward with this legislation now? Why not wait until more studies are released? That's just such a great question because that's what everybody in the public is asking. Uh, first of all, we have done a survey and it indicates that well up to 80 percent of the public simply do not want to take the risk in their own lives that the users of this product are willing to take in their lives. So they're asking those who are using it simply to not use it in public places. They can use other products that help them get that nicotine fix, like a, a nicotine patch, for those periods of time that they might be in a restaurant or in a bar. Uh, and, and the reason why it's important is why it is for other mood and altering chemicals. It's not unusual for us to say that until a product can be proved to be fairly safe for the public, that we don't allow pharmaceutical companies to sell it until they demonstrate its safety, rather than asking the public to take a risk on a substance like this uh, and then find out later that it was problematic. So we've sort of divided that down, saying if an adult wants to take the risk in their own lives, with their own lungs, in their own brain, uh, well, we will keep it legal. But we're saying that the general public does not want to take the risk on a product that's not been tested with them and are asking to keep their indoor air clean. And this really is big business. The Bl Bloomberg estimates that the e-cigarette industry nationally could hit $1.5 billion in sales, surpassing traditional tobacco products. That's a fabulous uh, income, isn't it? And it's being uh, marketed and targeted in ways that uh, are directed at young people because we know that the brain chemistry of young people is very, very absorbent of these uh, addictive substances. So if you can get somebody addicted to nicotine early in life, uh, then they're very highly uh, probably going to stay connected to the, either the e-cigarettes or tobacco. As a matter of fact, uh, I've just read an article in the New York Times of a study that showed that young people who started to use e-cigarettes are transitioning into tobacco use at high rates. So uh, we want to be very concerned about not allowing access to this product to young people because of brain chemistry difficulties and vulnerability to really deeply fixed addiction. And we don't want to have it in public places where modeling occurs, where they're going to be able to see the glamour of the uh, entire product and want to utilize it. We want to see regulation be developed first on how it can be marketed, who it can be marketed to. Uh, we want to see studies done that are able to say, if you put this product in one of these capsules, uh, that it's going to have this impact in the vapor. We just simply don't have that information yet. So until we do, 80% of the public are saying, we don't want to take the risk with the users of e-cigarettes. I don't think that's an unreasonable request to be made, and, and the legislation is trying to support the public. Many cities have uh, already implemented various uh, forms of restrictions on e-cigarettes. Those cities are coming forward and saying, we really need the statewide policy and uh, not have this kind of variation on laws throughout the state, like we did before with the uh, smoking ban in public places, but uh, this will allow a standardized law that governs e-cigarettes until the public can feel fairly safe that they're not taking excessive risk. Frankly, I should close with that, but I do need to ask you, the House has already taken out the public place language from its, its legislation. It has a long way to go before it hits the House floor. Your legislation has a ways to go before it hits the Senate floor. Is that a component that you'd be willing to wiggle on if it means getting something passed? Well, I think that it would be short-sighted to, uh, especially if you're concerned about young people, those under the age of 18, which is the component that restricts sales to young people, I think that you would be really shortening your capacity to impact that if you allow smoking in public places of e-cigarettes because the modeling behavior and the marketing behavior around this is really targeted to young people. Okay, Senator, this of course is a very closely watched piece of legislation and we will track it throughout session as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.
Senator Sean Nina joins me now to also discuss the e-cigarette regulations. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time, Senator. Glad to be here. Let's begin with what is being proposed in the Senate right now and really nationally. About 27 states ban e-cigarette use for minors at this point. Three states ban the use of e-cigarettes indoors. Do you think Minnesota should join the ranks? Well, I think the, the bill is pointed in the right direction, but it goes way overboard. Uh, basically, it treats an e-cigarette exactly like a tobacco cigarette. And, and they're not comparable a, at all in many ways, but yet they are comparable in, in other ways. It is essentially uh, a potential nicotine delivery system. So the question arises, do we really want to make that legal for young students and kids and, and minors. Uh, I think that's a legitimate approach to say we should restrict access. You shouldn't be allowed to sell to minors um, because mostly uh, they're using them for the nicotine. And yet you say it's in the right direction in some ways. That, that I, I assume that is the right direction. So are you not in support of banning them in public places? Well, the, that was the other portion of the bill, Section 1 of the bill, and, and uh, we actually had a hearing on this. Senator Sharon presented the bill before the Health Committee, and, and my comment to her was, you're this close to one of those kumbaya bills. All the opponents are saying the second part of the bill, that's fine. They're mostly already voluntarily doing that. But the first part of the bill bans an electronic cigarette. Uh, vaping is, is the term people use for it. It bans vaping in public places. And the problem I have with that is... Mostly what we're talking about is businesses. Somebody owns a business, maybe it's an office, maybe it's a restaurant, maybe it's a bar, maybe it's a bowling center. Um, government is now getting in and regulating how they will operate their business. And my position is that if we're going to do that, if government is going to regulate how you control your own personal property and self, there has to be a compelling public interest that is overriding and justifies that intrusion. With tobacco cigarettes, there's lots of science behind secondhand smoke and, and whether it's harmful. And you can make the argument that the compelling public interest is there. With electronic cigarettes, there is absolutely no science that says that secondhand vapor uh, is of any threat to anybody. There is no scientific evidence that says that. And when I asked Senator Sharon about that, and we spoke about how inconclusive a lot of these studies are at this point, she said that really this comes down to modeling as well, where why would you allow people to smoke an e-cigarette in a restaurant where you're therefore modeling to young, to minors, that it's okay to do so? So do you buy that argument? Well, to that I would just answer with a question, then why allow anybody to smoke tobacco cigarettes ever? Okay, but Senator, moving past that argument a little bit, do you think that, that there's any merit to it at all? I, you know, if you want to go down that path, then just make it illegal. Um, if you're not going to make it illegal, then stop micromanaging individual behavior when it's not a threat to anyone else's health or safety. And I guess therein lies the, the crux of the argument. Proponents of that legislation say, well, there is a threat. There is still some secondary vaporization going on. Opponents uh, such as yourself say that it is, um, it, again, inconclusive. You don't know how harmful it is. So why not err on the side of caution? Because it's a private business and government has to have, the term I used in committee, government has to have a demonstrable compelling public interest that overrides your right to operate and use your own personal property the way that you see fit to run your office space. Uh, we have OSHA, you know, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They have regulations because they've identified that operating certain machinery certain ways is a risk. But we don't come in and say, yeah, but we're going to require this because there's an unknown risk. Uh, we have a demonstrated need to protect somebody or something to maintain safety. That's the difference, is there is no demonstrated need. Okay, so moving forward, Senator, in the House, that particular language has been stripped from its legislation. There are still some stops to go in the Senate before it makes it to the floor. Where do you see your role in this process as it makes it to the floor, if it makes it to the floor? For me personally, to continue to make that argument, that there isn't a demonstrated risk to the public, and without a demonstrated risk, what we are doing is regulated for, in the terms of Senator Sharon, unknown risk. Well, we don't regulate for unknown, unidentified risk. We regulate 
to maintain safety for identified and known risks. And until we have that, we shouldn't be regulating something because it feels good. And do you think that argument can gain you enough support in the Senate to, to offer an amendment and get that provision stripped from the, the legislation? I would hope so. You know, you don't know until all the votes go up, but I would hope so. Okay. Senator Sean Nino, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Glad to be here. Dog and cat breeders could soon find themselves under state oversight. Senator John Marty is carrying the bill in an effort to stamp out inhumane conditions from some breeding facilities. I witnessed dogs fed roadkill, amateur practice C-sections, and or whatever else is necessary to make sure that there's puppies always available for sale, and that's what drives this industry. Some of these environments required hazard materi material suits uh, simply because without them you couldn't enter and sometimes breathe due to the staggering amount of excrement, odor, and uh, potential pathogen. Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, Minnesota currently does not have any language in state law that specifically regulates commercial dog breeding and cat breeding facilities. There's no required inspections. There's no current licensing program. Senate File 36 provides regulation which is preventative. That there are 475 Minnesota cat and dog breeders who would come within the definition of commercial breeder under this bill. There is not a scrap of information indicating how many, if any, problematic breeders there may be among those to be regulated. It is likely that nearly every breeder who would be licensed under this scheme would already be subject to nearly identical regulations and inspections by the United States Department of Agriculture. Minnesota has some of the largest dog breeding kennels in the nation. Those kennels could be under new regulation if a proposal authored by Senator John Marty is passed. Senator Marty joins me now to talk about this legislation. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So, Senator, right now, how does it, um, what do you think this legislation is needed and what are the parameters within your bill? Okay, first of all, we see many times that through complaint or humane societies finding animals that are being sold by these what some might call puppy mills that are have been abused i mean poorly treated there have been cases in which there are animal cruelty charges brought against the dog or cat breeder and so this bill which limits it just to dog and cat breeder and we're only taking the larger ones those that breed at least five litters a year and at least 10 adults um, involved in it um, only those larger operations we would require them to be uh, licensed by the State Board of Animal Health and to be inspected um, at least initially every year to make sure they're they're following our laws. And in the past we have had some who, uh, it may be a small number of breeders, but they're ones who are really mistreating animals in a horrid way. And I think we it's time for us to recognize the need we step forward, not based on complaint, not wait till their complaints and then find somebody to go investigate and have people charged with crimes, but have it preventive where we make sure that dog and cat breeding operations are all good, sound animal management and they treat the animals humanely. And to that point, you brought up the complaint system that's currently in place. Will that system still be in place if somebody sees something? Can they oh, still yes, report yes, it? People can still report. We, we want that to happen, but the point is we want to avoid we want to avoid the maltreatment of animals in the first place. We want to make sure they're treated in a humane way. The pictures we we had handed around to the committee were really horrid pictures of animals who were abused. Many times they had huge health problems because of it. Um, you don't want to have people's future pets be raised that way. It's just not humane. Senator, this bill's been around a long time, at least six years, and, and it seems that the opposition, it still exists, but it's softened considerably. What have you been doing to try to pull in some of these stakeholders, and what do you say to those who still oppose the measure? Sure. Well, there's lots of bills, no matter how they come down, there's still going to be some opposition. We've been working with the Minnesota Veterinary Medicine Association, the animal humane groups, um, some of the other groups that have concerns about and with some of the breeders. And I think what we've done is try and limit it to um, to try and get at the worst case things. We're trying not to have an onerous system of regulation, but one that just basically makes sure that the state can check into it and that they are following our laws on animal cruelty to make sure they're not abusing and mistreating the animals. Taxpayers are going to want to know how is this going to be implemented, what is, what is the cost, sure. and is it going to be cost prohibitive then for some of these breeders to stay in Minnesota, as you know, is an argument? Some, some of these breeders, I mean, they're selling these animals for very high very high amounts of money and there's a lot of cost in it but some of the breeders the ones who 
I think are most concerned about this are some ones who have been cutting corners and not treating the animals well. When you have cages stacked on top of each other and the urine and feces drip down on the lower ones, it's crude to talk about, but that's what some of these animals have been living in that. And it's horrendous things. And I think making sure we prevent that is, is very important. I think the public overwhelmingly supports this. And the cost of those regulatory things, I think, is 200 some thousand dollars. I haven't seen the final estimate of the cost. And most of that's going to be recovered through licensing fees and inspection. The, the department would be collecting the fees that's supposed to pay for most of that. And one of the arguments that is still out there is, especially by some of the breeders, They've never been regulated before. They don't want to be. So why? Why, why move in that and, direction? And you know, it's, it's interesting. On one hand, they say that. On the other hand, they say, oh, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, oh, they are expanding the number of kennels they cover and they inspect and everything else. Well, some of the worst cases of animal cruelty, there was one in Dakota County, I think one in Cass County, and a third one, that were all USDA breeders. They had already been approved by the federal government has, when they've done it, they don't inspect for humane treatment of animals or anything like that. They don't concern themselves with our laws. I'm not sure what all they do inspect for, but they've allowed these to continue. So on one hand, some of the opponents are saying, oh, we're already overly regulated. On the other hand, they're saying, oh, we've never been regulated and we shouldn't be. But we think it's important. And I think if you ask the public, do you think we should make sure that animals, dogs and cats are humanely raised and people shouldn't be allowed to just raise them for huge amounts of money without regard to the well-being of the animals? I think overwhelmingly the people would say this is a reasonable regulatory system to protect the well-being of animals. Finally, Senator, as I mentioned earlier, this has been around a very long time. It's rarely gained traction. What makes you optimistic? Are you optimistic that this is the year? I'm very hopeful. Um, everybody on both sides sides of the issue are tired of the issue, but again, we've brought together, again, some of the breeder groups are now supportive, the Board of Animal Health, we've got the, um, we've got the Minnesota Veterinary Medicine you, you Association. You need them to get we, enough we support wanted to, We've been, the Minnesota Veterinary Medicine Association, the Farmers Union, some of those other groups, they have been looking at it, and they have concerns, they want to make sure we are not overstepping anything and so on, and I think we've got a good system in place. And the veterinarians had some very good proposals to make sure that all breeders go through some veterinary protocol to make sure the animals are healthy. And I think, I think that's in the public interest, and I think the public, uh, there are people, dog and cat lovers, who will do anything to make sure this bill passes. Um, they've been working for a long, hard time on this. I'm pleased that we were finally able to bring everyone together and come up with a compromise that I think will help protect the public interest on this. And you think you have the votes? I think we will. Okay, Senator John Marty, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Leather and denim dominated the Capitol Wednesday morning with hundreds of motorcycle enthusiasts rallying to make sure their voices are heard this legislative session. It's been a tradition for more than a decade, and it's grown from a small group to a large, well-organized force. We're going to be out on the road in May, maybe April, hopefully April. You know, keep an eye out for us. We're going to do what we can to ride responsibly and promote the po positive aspects of riding. Senator Karen Housley has co-authored legislation that provides affordable health care to corrections employees who are rendered permanently disabled in the line of duty. She's here to explain exactly what that is and what it means for corrections officials. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it, Senator. Thanks for having me, Julie. Well, let's begin with your proposal. You know, it's very specific and it's a reaction to a very specific incident. Can you begin by describing what that story was? Yep, I got contacted back in May by the Campa family and Dave Campa was a correctional facility worker at the Stillwater Prison, which is in my district. Back in 2010, he was, there was a, a fight that broke out in the prison, shock, and um, he's been there for 30 years and it was routine to always, you know, run and try and break up the fight. This time he went to break it up and he got punched, blindsided, and fell back, knocked unconscious, and hit the Stillwater prison bars and was further knocked out. He ended up um, being completely disabled and unable to work, and that happened in 2010. So it 
What happened was his insurance coverage went from him paying on the employee insurance $163 a month to more than $1,600 a month because he was dropped and not covered, even though he was injured on the job. So he has been the only one that this has happened to, but, but employees, policemen and firemen are covered if they are injured on the job, and Department of Corrections officers aren't. So, I, and none of them, none of them knew this. None of the corrections officers knew this when they, when they answered to these prison fights. So a lot, of, a lot of them were completely shocked when this happened to Dave Campa. And so what exactly would your legislation do? It would, it would continue the employee coverage that he had before his injury. So he would go back to paying his $163 a month. What happened to the campus is they, they had to sell their business. They started selling items in their house just to afford to pay their $1,600 a month. But again, nobody at the Department of Corrections knew that they wouldn't be covered if they were injured on the job and deemed, uh, deemed person, um, completely disabled. So I want to take this a little bit further because, as I mentioned earlier, this is very specific legislation based off of an incident. So is this intentional or do you think your proposal, did it, does it start this way? But do you see room for expansion to other state officials or does something have to happen before those other... <laughs> those other employees are, are brought in. It's one of those where the campus wanted this legislation so this would never happen to anybody else again. And we haven't heard from any other state employees that that they don't know they're they're not covered or that they'd like to be covered. So I don't know where it it can go or would go from here if anybody's going to request it. I'm sure if anybody does, we'll always be open to looking at it because we wouldn't want anything to happen like happened to the campus. And you're working on this legislation with Democrat Senator Barb Goodwin, an example of working across party lines to get something accomplished early on. So what's next for your bill? I, I think it's coming to the floor. I don't know, I don't know when, it, and Senator Goodwin and I talk about um, you, you always hear about uh, the two sides of the aisle digging their heels in and how we don't get along. And Senator Goodwin and I have a couple of bills out there together. So it, it's very fun to work with someone when there's a, a common sense legislation that can get done and to doesn't always get all the media attention. Which is why we're bringing you on <laughs> Capitol you. Report. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's very fun working with her, and I think it should be coming to the floor soon. Okay, any, uh, any word in the House? We were saying off camera that you're not sure where it's going. I talked to Representative Detmer. He's the one who who's carrying it in the House, and he said he, he's expecting it to come to a couple of committees next week, and he hopes it, it gets through to the floor quickly, too. And my last question for you, Senator, is it doesn't seem that there is any opposition to this legislation, at least in the House. So do you think, or in the Senate, excuse me, do you think that there's going to be a holdup, or is this kind of a, a done deal? I think it's a, I think it's a done deal, because everybody that I've spoken to or that has even come to my office that have seen the, the media reports, it, it is just, it's common sense legislation, so I don't think there will be any, I hope. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad that we were able to shed some media attention on this proposal. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Thanks, Julie. And that wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thanks for watching this week's Capitol Report.